This uh, video is on uh, press posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, border zone infarction, and dural sinus thrombosis. Let's uh, start off with a case presentation. 52-year-old woman, altered mental status, sepsis, multiple organ failure, and cortical blindness. Head CT shows extensive hypodensity in the subcortical white matter. Focal area of hemorrhage uh, here. MRI, flare images, extensive flare hyperintense signal uh, in subcortical white matter, also gray matter tends to be involving the posterior parts of the brain, also posterior fossa. Gradient echo images uh, show scattered areas of uh, hemorrhage. Diffusion weighted images. Uh, most of the abnormality has uh, increased uh, diffusion, although there's a little bit of restricted diffusion in cortex here. You can see a little bit bright on the diffusion weighted images. Pre and post contrast, a uh, little bit of linear enhancement, not very much. So this is a case of posterior irreversible encephalopathy syndrome, or PRESS. Uh, these patients usually present with seizures, often have visual impairment, uh, which may uh, be a cortical blindness or homonymous hemianopsia. And that's because uh, there's often involvement of the occipital lobes and uh, typically have headache and confusion. A lot of uh, associated etiologic factors, about three quarters of the patients will have hypertension, but that means 25% will have normal blood pressure. It's associated with eclampsia and preeclampsia, autoimmune diseases, lupus, scleroderma, TTP, uh, immunosuppressive drugs, especially cyclosporin and tacrolimus, uh, perhaps the most uh, common associated uh, factors uh, seen uh, after uh, solid organ and uh, bone marrow transplants, and is also associated with uh, sepsis and multi-organ failure. Uh, no one's sure exactly what uh, what's going on, in, uh, uh, but uh, is generally thought to represent endothelial injury, impaired autoregulation, and consequent vasogenic edema. So what do we see on imaging? First, uh, symmetric areas of edema in the subcortical white matter. Uh, there may also be cortical involvement, but typically the subcortical white matter is involved more than the cortex. The posterior fossa is commonly involved. There may or may not be a little bit of contrast enhancement. Most of the time there's normal or increased uh, diffusion. Restricted diffusion uh, is seen in about 20% of cases and hemorrhage in about 15% of cases. Next, a 55-year-old man, one day after a section of sphenoid wing meningioma. Flare images show symmetric areas of abnormality. Again, this involves the gray matter and subcortical white matter bilaterally. Gradient echo images uh, show bilateral hemorrhage. Uh, the hemorrhage seems to be involving uh, mostly the cortex. Pre and post contrast, uh, no enhancement. You can see the uh, pneumocephalus in the post-operative patient. Diffusion weighted images. There is, uh, in this case, a restricted uh, diffusion. Uh, 
bilaterally in the prior occipital regions, especially involving a cortex. This is a case of watershed or border zone infarction. So uh, I'd like to just review the border zone locations. Uh, there's a superficial border zone, and that's between the cortical branches of the anterior and middle cerebral arteries, and between the cortical branches of the middle and posterior cerebral arteries. There's also a deep border zone, and this involves the deep white matter, and that's between the cortical branches of the middle cerebral artery and the lenticular striate arteries that arise from the proximal MCA. So the lenticular striate arteries go upward through the basal ganglia, and the cortical branches of the middle cerebral artery go down through the cortex, and the border zone, the, in, the deep border zone, uh, is in the region of the centrum semiovalle. So the superficial border zones, uh, this is the diagram of the uh, typical border zone locations. Superficial border zone infarcts are typically bilateral and due to a hypotensive episode. Uh, since, there's, since they're not associated with vascular occlusion, when the blood pressure is restored, you have the full systolic blood pressure going into the injured brain. So these are often hemorrhagic. We often see early enhancement. <coughs> uh, the superficial border zone can also involve deep gray matter structures. If you see a unilateral infarct <clears throat> that looks like it's in the superficial border zone, uh, these are often actually embolic infarcts, even though the location looks border zone. So the typical <clears throat> hypotensive infarcts are bilateral. The deep border zone, these infarcts are usually unilateral and they're associated with high-grade stenosis or occlusion of the internal carotid or middle cerebral arteries. And they often form this string of beads uh, appearance in the centrum semiovalle corona radiata. Thirty-nine-year-old man with headache, altered level of consciousness. CT shows bilateral parasagittal areas of hypodensity, along with areas of hemorrhage. Look higher up on this non-contrast CT, we can see high density within the sagittal sinus, uh, also in cortical veins. This is a non-con CT. MR and flare images, so we do see some high signal along uh, gyri, maybe into some sulci, uh, areas of hemorrhage on gradient echo images. Post contrast T1 shows some uh, linear areas of enhancement. Uh, uh, some of these are along the peel surface of the brain. If we look carefully, we can see a filling defect in the sagittal sinus. Diffusion-weighted images, uh, in this case, not much uh, restricted diffusion, um, just a little bits associated with uh, hemorrhage. And this is a patient with drill sinus thrombosis. The patients usually present with uh, headache. They often have elevated intracranial pressure that uh, may present as papilledema, vomiting, altered level of consciousness. Seizures and focal neurologic deficits are also frequent. Etiologic factors, uh, they can be, can be secondary to an adjacent sinusitis or mastoiditis with the secondary occlusion of the sinuses. Uh, meningioma and dural metastases can cause sinus occlusion. Typically, the meningiomas cause gradual sinus occlusion uh, that uh, most often does not cause clinical symptoms. Uh, dehydration is a cause, particularly in children. Uh, 
pregnancy uh, and hypercoagulable states. Pathophysiologically, there's elevated venous and capillary pressure causing a decrease in the interstitial CSF resorption and resultant interstitial edema. Uh, because of this elevated pressure, venous infarction is often accompanied by hemorrhage. Uh, sinus thrombosis is most common in the sagittal sinus, uh, followed by transverse sinus, straight sinus, and deep venous system. So the imaging findings, the first in the brain parenchyma, we see edema involving gray and white matter, hematomas near the gray-white junction. Uh, the location of the findings depends on which sinus is involved. If it's the sagittal sinus, typically parasagittal regions, transverse sinus most frequently involves temporal lobes, and the deep venous system, we often see abnormalities in the thalami. There may or may not be restricted diffusion. So this differs from arterial infarction, which uh, pretty much always has restricted diffusion. In venous infarction, it's a mixture of infarction and interstitial edema. So the interstitial edema is extracellular. That tends to cause increased uh, diffusion. Uh, infarction itself causes restricted diffusion. So you have some mixture of these findings so that there may or may not be restricted diffusion uh, on the diffusion weighted images. Uh, we often see dural enhancement. Findings within the veins and sinuses on CT. If it's acute, we can see high density clot in the dural sinuses or the cortical veins uh, on a non-contrast CT. Uh, filling defect on a contrast CT, so-called empty delta sign. On MR, uh, for acute thrombosis, the first uh, few days, we see low signal in the sinus on T2 and uh, gradient, exo, gradient echo images because of deoxyhemoglobin. In the subacute phase, uh, after a few days uh, lasting for several weeks, we'll see high signal on T1 weighted images from methemoglobin. And after contrast, we may see a filling defect within the sinus. Time of flight, MR venography, no flow within the sinus. So you can see here, absent flow within the sagittal sinus. Here's a CT. This is a non-con CT. We see high density in the transverse uh, sinus. Uh, also uh, in the straight sinus here. And then post-contrast uh, filling defect within the sinus. So no enhancement within the thrombosed sinus. Here's the empty delta sign. Now one thing that is often confused with the dural sinus thrombosis is uh, this uh, lesion here. This is a non-contrast CT with a low density area within the sinus. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see that there's a, the, the bone is actually scooped out here a little bit, suggesting that this is, this is something that's been there a long time. Here's the uh, MR, this is a T2-weighted image on this patient. You see this round high signal lesion within the sagittal sinus. Post contrast, here you see this round non-enhancing focus within the sinus. And this represents an arachnoid granulation. And the key to differentiating arachnoid granulation from a sinus thrombosis is that the arachnoid granulation usually has signal that's similar to CSF, both on the MR images and on the CT images. Usually it's round, uh, as opposed to sinus thrombosis, which uh, is more often uh, tubular or cast-like. So don't confuse this with uh, 
dural sinus thrombosis. Uh, a helpful clue, especially on CT, is uh, that uh, you will often see a groove in the uh, calvarium uh, where these are located. So treatment of dural sinus thrombosis uh, is anticoagulation. Even with the hemorrhage, uh, the treatment is still anticoagulation. If the patient is deteriorating, direct thrombolysis is sometimes performed, and occasionally craniectomy to treat markedly elevated intracranial pressure. Thanks for your attention.